We're back with part two. Since you are becoming a member of the Presbyterian family, it's important for you to know your roots and traditions. So for the next few minutes, we're going to look at the history of the Presbyterian Church in America to explain who we are and how we got this way. Then Bill and I will describe for you some of the features and distinctive characteristics that identify Presbyterians. But first, a video history lesson. Here we are, American Presbyterians as the 20th century draws to a close, celebrating reunion and new relocated national offices, symbolizing transition to who and what the Presbyterian Church USA is today. American Presbyterians are inclusive. We are Native American, African American, Hispanic, and Asian. And we Presbyterians are diverse theologically. Some of us emphasize order, others ardor. Some of us prefer to worship formally, others less so. Some of us evangelize with the word, others with deeds. Some of us exercise our discipleship personally, others socially. But that's who we are, diverse and inclusive. And this is how we got that way. Presbyterians began arriving in America in the 17th century. A few came to the first American colony in Virginia in 1607. Others helped settle the Massachusetts Bay Colony starting in 1620 before migrating southward. Others of Dutch Reformed and German Reformed traditions came to New York. Some French Presbyterians called Huguenots came to the Middle Colonies and to South Carolina. But it wasn't until the middle of the 17th century that immigrants who belonged to a Presbyterian church began to arrive in the New World. These were people from Scotland, escaping persecution at home. Many were Covenanters, who had signed a covenant to preserve the Church of Scotland from Episcopal-type control. For the same reason, Scottish Presbyterians residing in Northern Ireland, the so-called Scotch-Irish, began to pour into the middle colonies, making New York, New Jersey, and Philadelphia Presbyterian strongholds. In fact, the first presbytery was organized in this area in 1706 by a missionary preacher from Ireland, Francis McKinney, who served several churches himself. Puritan churches in New Jersey and Long Island soon joined the presbytery, giving it two different heritages, Scotch-Irish and English Puritan. Ten years later, the growing presbytery transformed itself into a general synod with four presbyteries, representing churches in the New York, New Jersey area, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland. At the synod's first meeting in 1717, it established a fund for pious uses. This turned out to be the church's first missionary fund. Presbyterians in America experienced their first serious conflict a few years later. Delaware ministers in Newcastle Presbytery, who had been educated in Great Britain, insisted that all Presbyterian ministers should subscribe to the Westminster Confession to ensure the rightness of their views. Persons of Scotch-Irish background agreed, but persons of the Puritan tradition in New England tended to oppose the subscription. Thus, Presbyterians gave the first indications of their theological diversity. The new synod avoided a serious split, however, thanks to a proposal by one Jonathan Dickinson. He suggested candidates for ministry be allowed to declare any reservation they held about the Westminster Confession or the larger or shorter catechisms. And if they did, the ordaining body could decide if the reservation was essential enough to bar ordination. This was part of the Adoption Act of 1729. The Adoption Act also declared the Synod's strong support of religious freedom and the separation of church and state. Another important principle was also being established in these early years, that the courts or structures of the Presbyterian Church in America were being organized from the ground up, not from the top down, as had been the case in England and Scotland. The first missionary commissioned by American Presbyterians was the Reverend Azariah Horton. 
He was designated by the Presbytery of New York to serve members of the Shinnecock tribe in Long Island. Educating ministers in the New World was an informal and almost private undertaking until William Tennant, a pastor at Neshaminy, Pennsylvania, built a log college for this purpose. Some 18 ministers to be graduated from this modest facility. Tennant's log college inspired other educational efforts. In the year of his death, 1746, the College of New Jersey was chartered and eventually was located at Princeton. A century and a half later, it became Princeton University and is known as the mother of many American colleges. During this period, a New Jersey pastor, Gilbert Tennant, the son of William, adopted revivalist views being preached by a nearby Dutch Reformed pastor who was stirring religious interest with a call for conversion and spiritual evidences. Similarly, the preaching of George Whitfield, an English minister, greatly influenced Gilbert Tennant. Whitfield visited the colonies several times, appeared at a number of Presbyterian churches, and stirred up great crowds with his gospel preaching. These revivalist voices led to America's great religious awakening. But with it came another test of Presbyterian theology and order. Revivalist Presbyterians called the New Side Party were based in Tennant's home presbytery, New Brunswick, recently established by the Synod. Tennant publicly vilified other Presbyterian ministers who didn't agree with his approach. The Synod in 1741 reproached Tennant and his New Side Party and declared, probably illegally, that New Brunswick Presbytery was no longer part of the Synod. This caused Presbyterians to take sides, and four years later, Two other presbyteries, New York and Newcastle, joined New Brunswick to form a new synod, the Synod of New York. Adding to the conflict was a reappearance of the earlier issue of subscription to the Westminster Confessions. Thus, the fledgling Presbyterian Church in America divided into two contending parts, the Synod of New York with the New Side viewpoints and the Synod of Philadelphia with what came to be called the Old Side views. Again, however, reason prevailed, and the two synods compromised their differences and reunited in 1758 as the Synod of New York and Philadelphia. As a part of this action, the Westminster Confessions became the standard of the church. During this same period, another Presbyterian church was taking shape farther inland. The Covenanters and seceders from Scotland had been moving from the Atlantic coast into western Pennsylvania, the seceders left the Church of Scotland because they disagreed with the way pastors were selected. In Pennsylvania, the seceders organized themselves in 1753 as the Associate Presbytery of Pennsylvania, and the Covenanters became the Reformed Presbyterian Church in America in 1774. Eight years later, they united to form the Associate Reformed Synod of Pennsylvania. Some historians claim the Presbyterians, more than any other single group, were responsible for the American Revolution. Their Scottish background biased them against English rulers. Opposing tyranny was in their genes. The new president of Princeton College was John Witherspoon, a descendant of John Knox, recruited from Paisley, Scotland in 1768. And he was a loud advocate of self-rule and justice in the colonies. As events were leading inevitably to war, the colonies rushed to establish political structures with duly elected representatives. A provincial congress elected Witherspoon to the Continental Congress with the clear instruction to join others in declaring the United Colonies independent. Witherspoon was the only active clergyman to sign the Declaration of Independence, but 11 of the other signers were Presbyterians as well and the document reflected many of their views. Witherspoon and other Presbyterians joined in the revolt which led to final separation from England. After the war, the Presbyterians decided they needed to form a national organization reflective of the new spirit of nationalism. The Synod of New York and Philadelphia organized a general assembly with four synods, New York and New Jersey, Philadelphia, Virginia, and the Carolinas. Included were 16 presbyteries, 177 ministers, 
and 419 churches. At Second Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, the first General Assembly was convened in 1789 by John Witherspoon. At the same time, the first United States Congress was meeting in New York and installing George Washington as president. Seven years earlier, the Women's Missionary Society had been chartered in Pennsylvania. Presbyterian ideas and reform traditions clearly influenced the national constitution and the representative form of government. Indeed, the new U.S. Constitution began with the words of Scottish church contracts, we the people. Their role in the war and in political thought gave Presbyterians considerable influence after the revolution. But its representative polity, its insistence on an educated clergy and the scholastic form of its doctrines retarded its ability to grow rapidly or to find widespread popularity in the new country. In the last decade of that century, another revival, characterized by camp meetings, developed along the frontier of Kentucky. And soon, it spread across the nation. Seeking to respond to this, Presbyterians in Kentucky began ordaining ministers whose education was unsatisfactory to the larger church and who rejected parts of the Westminster Confessions. When the Synod of Kentucky and the General Assembly acted against this practice, the Cumberland Presbyterian Church came into being in 1810, creating now a third stream of Presbyterianism in the new nation. During this same decade, the General Assembly appointed an African-American, John Chavis, as a missionary among people of his own color. Chavis was educated at Princeton under Witherspoon. And another African-American, John Gloucester, and Gideon Blackburn started work with 15,000 Cherokees in Tennessee during this same period. At the turn of the century, Presbyterians focused their attention on the western frontier, they organized mission societies and raised funds. They chartered colleges and seminaries. Home missions and overseas missions captured the imagination of ministers and congregations, including work among Spanish-speaking peoples that William C. Blair began in Texas. But three decades into the 19th century, the absorbing question became slavery and dissatisfaction developed in some quarters with a plan of union with congregational churches. New side, old side tensions reappeared on this issue. And in 1837, the old school side had the votes to defeat the plan. The action taken also announced that four synods organized under the plan were no longer part of the church. This split the denomination into two almost equal parts and each retained the same official denominational name. So, for the next 32 years, Presbyterians were identified as Old School or New School. But more division was to come. As the slavery issue sharpened and brought on war, Northern abolitionists pressed their position. This led Southern Presbyterians in both the New School and the Old School to withdraw. In 1861, Old School Presbyterians in the South organized the Presbyterian Church in the Confederate States. Three years later, the New School Presbyterians in the South joined them. Shortly after the end of the war between the states in 1869, the Old School and New School branches in the North came together again as the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America. And both Old and New sides in the South were now together in the Presbyterian Church in the U.S. But there was also at this time the Cumberland Presbyterian offshoot in Kentucky and the border states, and the separate United Presbyterian Church of North America, just formed through further mergers in the seceders and covenanters in Pennsylvania. About 50 years later, in 1906, the Cumberland Church merged with the Presbyterian Church in the USA, giving the Northern Church a nationwide church constituency. Some Cumberland churches chose not to merge and continued a separate existence. Fundamentalism caused some Presbyterians to break away in the 1930s to form the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and from it, the Bible Presbyterian Church. Thus, Presbyterianism in the United States in the first half of the 20th century was in three primary streams. 
the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, the Presbyterian Church U.S., Southern, and the United Presbyterian Church of North America, centered in Pennsylvania. Following the example of other denominations, Presbyterians began ordaining women to the office of elder in the 1930s and as ministers in the 1950s. In the expansive days following the Second World War, considerable effort was made to get the three streams together. But new racial tensions in the country upset these efforts. In 1958, two of the streams did merge, the United Presbyterian and the Presbyterian Church in the USA. During joint general assemblies in Pittsburgh, they became the United Presbyterian Church in the USA. It took another 25 years of negotiating and healing before Southern Presbyterians could join them. But in 1983, in Atlanta, Georgia, they did join with the other Presbyterians to form the Presbyterian Church USA. Would you please vote by standing? But even then, not all Southern churches did reunite. Two small groups emerged, the Presbyterian Church in America and the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And so, the reunited Presbyterian Church continues in American life. In recent years, Presbyterians, as other mainline denominations, have suffered losses in membership and diminished influence. Even so, Ideas and ideals Presbyterians have constantly supported remain deeply embedded in American values. Resistance to tyranny, education, the common good, separation of church and state, representative government with shared power and authority, and personal responsibility. These values, along with our inclusiveness and our diversity, are a Presbyterian legacy to American society. As was suggested in what we just saw, Presbyterians within the Reformed tradition stand for certain things, and these things tend to set us apart from other religious orientations. For one, we believe in the sovereignty of God. That is, we believe that God's reign and love are not just for God's church or the lives of God's people, but for all of creation, for all of life governments, economies, as well as for persons and human relationships. We also believe baptized Christians are called to be stewards of God's creation. We recognize the natural order, knowledge, grace, medicine and healing, even our own personal lives and talents, that these are from God and belong to God. And our task in life is to use them, manage them for God's purposes, not ours. So Presbyterians are people who care about social matters, about their communities and the world around them, for the common good as well as the good of individuals. Presbyterians work for justice and peace. Presbyterians stand for education because they believe all truth is God's truth. And we see a relationship between what one understands as God's truth and how one applies that and lives that out. So Presbyterians want an educated clergy, an educated laity, and an educated society. Many institutions of higher education were started by Presbyterians, and today education within the church remains a priority. Presbyterians also stand for checks and balances in civil and church government. This comes from our recognition that sin pervades all of life, including systems of government and economics. Even the lives of Christians and of the institutional church we doubt that perfection is possible and suspect that corruption is likely. So we want checks and balances in civil and church government. We want those who govern to be elected by those who would govern. And we give elders equal governing power with clergy in our church. Let us pray. What you've just mentioned, Dan, reflects also the Reformed tradition in which we Presbyterians stand. The hallmark of that tradition is the church reformed and always reforming. Much more needs to be said about what Presbyterians believe, and we'll do that next.